love, precious seekers for your own freedom, know that the full power of the three times three is the mighty momentum of the stream of love that issues from God's heart. Filling the universe with abundant joy, it flows forth into thine own heart. This is the cosmic fount of pure love that springs up as the crowning radiance of each manifestation in nature, in the angelic hosts, and in man. It is to this love of God that we must pay tribute whenever we drink in the floral fragrances of the blossoms of natural beauty nodding in the sunlight and the gentle wind. This love is also the motivating power behind all angelic action. Therefore, those who would draw very close to the angelic hosts, that they might receive their protection, radiance, and blessing, will be most wise to keep harmonious at all times and to shun all forms of human discord. The greatest love ever to be found in man is the love which lays down its life daily to keep the well-being of its friend. What greater service can be rendered unto life than simply to manifest love? Remember, true love is the great magnet that draws forth the power of God's heart charged with His holy wisdom. The secret of the evocation of power, then, really lies within the heart of love. It must be acknowledged here that men and women of the first ray who so successfully invoke power do so by turning to the great power of love and drawing there from the power of God. A love's labor lost in human compromise. Unfortunately, some among our readers out of sheer ignorance, and sometimes bigotry, look to find a flaw in our teaching and our released concept. Now, the human mind can be very tricky and stubborn. If individuals determine that they are going to find a flaw or contradiction in our words, be assured that they will. Then, too, the sleuths inspecting for fallacy in the logos itself can always find a false answer or wrong conclusion by the same systems of human logic which at their bidding will support or justify their own ends according to the premise taken. I regret that such as these are moved by their vacuums of self-knowledge and a desire for self-righteousness, but I cannot be moved to undue concern for them. One day they will humbly seek truth. However, Lamb concerned for the sincere and would therefore mention the law of relationships involved in the polarizations of the human consciousness, as opposed to the law of the divine polarity inherent within every attribute, or beatitude, of the Godhead. Some of you are aware that the study of the relationship of opposites in the planes of relativity is reflected in the dialectic of the 19th century German philosopher George Hegel, who theorized that man's thought process and all historical change result from the interplay of three elements, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. According to this observer of life's forces, Every thesis generates its opposite, or antithesis, and the interaction of the two produces a synthesis which transcends both. The emerging synthesis in turn becomes a new thesis, and the entire process is repeated again and again. Thus, in the Hegelian dialectic all progress is brought about through the inevitable conflict of opposing forces, a principle Karl Marx turned upside down in his Dialectical Materialism, wherein he replaced Hegel's idealism with economic materialism. Whereas Hegel supported the value of the state and saw in the dialectical process the unfoldment of spiritual principle, Marx branded the state a mechanism of exploitation and claimed that all progress arises from conflicts involving the economic means of production. You who understand the premise of the Ascended Master's teachings to be the law of the one do not always take into account this law of relativity governing relative good and evil, perceived by psychologists, scientists, and the worldly philosophers. Moreover, in the world of Maya, where good and evil are always relatively in opposition, 
we must also reckon with the negative misqualification of the absolutes of power, wisdom and love upon which we have been discoursing. Therefore we would touch upon both the human and the divine equations. The law of the one, based on the unity of being, also functions within the framework of human reason and human events, and when it comes full circle in the individual's experience supports truth and exposes error. But in the human two-eyed perception of the world acquired after the departure from the Ednic self-knowledge in and as the one, when the world view of man and woman was no longer single in the immaculate all-seeing eye of God, but the same as that of the band of seducing fallen angels called serpents, there were unalterably two sides to every human equation, with the pendulum swing hot-cold, left-right, always just waiting to happen. Not so in the divine equation. Here the true divine polarity of Alpha and Omega, the plus-minus of the Godhead, and of each member of the Trinity are the masculine-feminine counterparts of being. These are complementary, not opposing, always fulfilling the law of the One as the Divine Whole. But in the human condition, just as there is a positive pole, so there is a negative pole to a given situation. These are opposing forces, rivalrous in nature and mutually destructive. For example, if the thesis be human love, its antithesis will be some form of love's polar opposite, human hatred, fear, suspicion or even mild dislike. Their synthesis will be a watered-down version of both with no commitment either to one or the other. This is the lukewarm state of mediocrity which Jesus spurned when he said, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And this is precisely why the economic evolution of mankind according to Marx and Lenin can never lead to the divine conclusion. Self-transcendence according to the law of love, the law of the one which self-contains the true trinity, power, wisdom, and love, as the triad of every man and woman's being. Apart from the double-minded who are unstable in all their ways, divine truth stands still as a son of love to melt the most brittle human concepts and to unveil the law of the one. b. The original premise and polarity of love. Now hear the word of the Lord. In the original premise of the Godhead, power or the will to be is the thesis. Wisdom is the antithesis and love is the synthesis. As wisdom magnetizes the intelligence inherent in the power of God, drawing it out into the word of all ideation now expressed, the twain become one, displaying the glorious revolution of love as the grand synthesis of power and wisdom. Love as the consummation of the essence of power wisdom then becomes the new thesis which embodies the fullest realization of itself in the work of the Lord, incarnating the three-in-one in every manifest action. This true synthesis of the divine attributes reveals that love, wisdom and power are in reality the one indivisible and divided whole which can never be divided or divisive, their atoms chanting as they chart the spheres. We are one, we are one, we are one. But this is not all. The cosmic white fire of the Universal Mother now enters. Born out of the unity of the Divine Triad, she whom I like to call the Luminous One steps forth out of her latency in the fiery nucleus of the threefold flame to become the antithesis, or Divine Polarity, of this thesis of the Trinity. And out of this union there is produced the synthesis of many manifestations of the whole, sons and daughters of God, each one a new premise embodying the fourfold attributes, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Mother, each self-expression of the whole uniquely synthesizing their qualities by ultimate free will in freedom's flame, not by some damnable inevitability of historical or economic forces successively enslaving the race, 
but by union in the law of the one, and then the three, girded by the fourth, the Blessed Mother. She manifesting her complementary nature as the Shakti of each person of the Trinity, releasing out of the white lily center of each plume, from the masculine plus, polarity of power, wisdom and love, the feminine minus manifestation in the worlds of form. As these four become the pillars in the temple of twin flames, foundations in their mighty work of the ages, they themselves become pillars in the temple of our God. And no other foundations or false premises or synthetic conclusions can be laid, for man as the offspring of the highest contains the original thesis, antithesis and synthesis as the trilogy of the threefold flame within his heart. He is also child man of the mother, containing her seed Adam and her sacred fire within himself, and none other can displace this fourfold foundation of his being, unless he himself succumb by choice to the lie and the liars who lead the pack of the international capitalist communist conspirators spawning their pseudo-metaphysical cults of materialism and the dialectic on planet Earth. Now let us see how love is in truth defined by the divine lovers, the path of fiery love, which is God's all-consuming sacred fire, consumes even the force of anti-love, the absolute evil of reprobate angels against the Godhead. For divine love is more than love, it is power and wisdom self-contained all in one, and then some. And herein lies love's mystery. Love is more than effect or lesser causation, it is first cause and the point of light beyond all light and darkness. Love is all love excelling beyond love's visible expressions and interchanges. Love is the unbeatable cosmic force. True love, divine love, in its very magic can still be known by twin flames dwelling in the twilight zone of adulterated love. For love is always pure and does not contain within itself any self-polluting, self-mutilating force such as fear of failure, fear of truth, fear of life, fear to be love. No interplays or power plays of human psychology can mar true love, but these can and do mar human love in incubation waiting, tending the flocks of consciousness until the angel of the Lord should trouble the waters of the mind and raise a single drop to the sun, whereby the whole fabric of human love surrenders in the embrace of the divine. True love is always understanding, yet not necessarily always understood. It speaks with the shepherd's voice of authority, never the petty tyrant. It chastens, peeling away by its caressing flames the layers of self-deception of child man. Love as discipline has the hardness of the diamond, shining mind of God that alone can bind the tyrant ego and set the captive free. From Christ's heart of true love, then, the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, are easily uttered. Love has no imitators, for God alone is love. You see, in the human sense of love there is love's thesis and antithesis self-contained. Thus, humanly speaking, that which has the capacity for human love also has the capacity for human hatred. And this is precisely the source of life's tragicomedy. But the divine is not so. In the absolute, where self-disintegration is not, where the law of human synthesis does not neutralize the plus and minus of the divine magnet, the attributes of God's power, wisdom and love are always personified in the polarity of twin flames representing the divine whole of the Father-Mother God. In the Hindu tradition these divine incarnations of the male and female principles of each plume of the Trinity are given names and are cherished as emanations of the Deity. In this relationship of the divine absolutes, Father is Thesis, Mother is Antithesis, and the whole of their creation, including the fruit of their Christ consciousness, is the synthesis 
their reason for being and for being the divine incarnation. What happens when the divine lovers meet in the divine embrace of the Tai Chi, the great causal body of God, is their net contribution to cosmos. So it is when twin flames return to the white fire ovoid of their origin. Only in this ultimate union, the celebration of the holy communion of Alpha and Omega, can the creative purpose of their being be fully realized. Thus, the divine lovers fulfilling the plus-minus interchange of the attribute of power are identified as Brahma and Sarasvati, who exemplify the masculine and feminine embodiment of the cosmic force. Notice the word I use to describe this yin and yang is not synthesis, for if either half of the whole were to lose the magnetism of this polarity of cosmic forces, the worlds of form would collapse. Hence interchange or exchange, yes. Synthesis, no. In the Hindu view Brahma as father figure, the first person of the Trinity, is described as the immense being, the creator, supreme ruler, lawgiver, sustainer, and source of all knowledge, while Sarasvati represents eloquence, the mother who articulates the wisdom of the law. She is mother teacher to those who love the law as God's will revealed by Brahma. Thus she is the power of volition, the will and motivation to be the law in action, the source, the river and the riverbed, for the flow of universal knowledge as appreciation for the law of the Creator self-contained in every particle of the creation. Likewise, the pair in polarity who comprise the law of the One in the attribute of wisdom are known and loved as real personalities, Vishnu and Lakshmi, embracing the circle of qualities attributed to one or the other, yet lovingly shared and divinely surrendered in the whirling sphere of their oneness. Thus, in heaven two equals one individed whole. On earth two in one often sacrifice their true identity to the human synthesis which becomes the new thesis, the distinction of the two parts of the original premise neutralized in the moving stream of relativity. For you see, relativity has no fixed polarity and therein lies its mutability. But above in the shining splendor of the sun, Vishnu, the immortal sun, stands the embodiment of cosmic Christ wisdom, whose essence is duration, the enduring quality, the very continuity of the consciousness of God. He is cohesiveness personified, bonding by wisdom's love the cosmic forces conceived in the universal mind. His way is liberation by self-knowledge in the highest God-Self. Vishnu, whose more famous incarnations have been Rama and Krishna, always Hari in manifestation, is the all-pervading protector, protecting, by God-awareness of the anti-Self, and then the annihilation thereof, that would steal that true Self before it is born in his little ones. This second person of the Trinity is the preserver of the divine design conceived in wisdom's flame out of power's lawful presence. He is the restorer of the universe by wisdom's all-healing light, the true power of illumination's alchemy of love. Vishnu's consort, Lakshmi, is eternally identifiable as the polarity of all that he is, her wisdom revealed in blessings of prosperity, the precipitation of abundance by the science of Prakriti and Purusa and the control of the four cosmic forces. She bears a cornucopia of good fortune by the eye magic of the all-seeing eye of her beloved. She teaches the mastery of karmic cycles on the cosmic clock and multiplicity and beauty, the one and the many out of the beautiful one, by mirroring the image of wisdom's God. So, too, the Holy Spirit comes alive in the charming personages of Shiva and his Shakti. Each one a sphere, yet simultaneously a half of the other, these divine complements of love stand as living proof before all souls in love that the opposite of divine love is not hatred but the balance, 
whether of masculine or feminine charge, of compassion, of kindness chastening with firmness, giving and receiving gratitude as active and passive modes of the same verb, to love. The dual nature of Shiva, the Lord of love, himself the destroyer-deliverer, is complemented by his consort, who in manifold form is both demon-slayer and child-saver. Parvati is the name of the benign daughter of the mountain, the beneficent, gentle mother and wife. The face of Durga is that of the fierce defender of her children, terrible and menacing to her enemies, the goddess beyond reach, while Kali, another metamorphosis of Shiva's feminine nature, represents the supreme night of the mother that swallows up the grid of karma and the time-space worlds that contain it. She complements Shiva's power in the destruction, by love, of the energy veil, illusion. She is the mother who lays down her life for the cause of her consort and her children. Her dread appearance is the symbol of her boundless power. Thus the spherical embodiment of absolute love by cosmic twin flames consumes the forces of absolute evil in the form and personages of anti-love arrayed against it. This force is embodied by the original betrayers of love, the fallen angels, who would, if they could, transfer it to love's own. Remember, then, always to differentiate between love's self-contained pure polarity of being and love diametrically opposed by a force alien to and outside of itself, and never make the mistake of confusing the two. The law of perversion by misqualification of the original principle in the practice of the black arts by adepts of the left-handed path, we see, is all confused and mixed up with the adaptation of the Hegelian synthesis to the communist worldview. In order for their theory to come out, they must insert seeds of corruption in every thesis they desire to swallow up by the creation of a synthetic, trumped-up antithesis. If Christ's truth be the premise of the abundant life on earth, the lie of Antichrist as opposition to all that Christ's truth is and stands for will be set up as antithesis to tear down, break up, compromise, and destroy. And the devil's delight is to hold up his red pajamas and say, See me. See my way of merry mediocrity. See my synthesis of two opposing systems that won't work without my intercession and expertise. But oil and water do not mix, nor bond and free, nor the ways of heaven and hell. There is no human solution or dissolution to the divine thesis. The cosmic honor flame stands alone, all one, as the flaming two-edged sword to keep the way of every man's tree of life. Its purity all-consuming is its only response to every synthetic, antithetical assailant of its divinity untouchable. And the divine alchemist knows the harmony of his elements and which admixture will cause explosion and injury to life, which is the universal solvent and which will change base metals into gold, and how to heal the flaws of gemstones and the gemstone of the heart. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And the twain shall not be forced to meet by devils disguised in philosophers' robes bearing their synthetic white stone and their compromise solution, which shall be their own dissolution in the end. See, the rock that is higher than I, therefore in love you must come up higher, you must meet love's standard. For divine love will not be compromised, nor can it suffer dissimulation. Love is the rock that David knew to be higher than the eye. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, he implored. Thus, contrary words of criticism and condemnation, words of harsh or hypocritical judgment, words of malintent, do not spontaneously spring forth from a heart such as his, accustomed to attunement, yea, that lives and breathes God's mighty flame of love. Have we not heard as John heard? 
He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? This maxim still speaks truth when made to read. If you do not see God and sense his love, you cannot truly love your brother. So Christ commanded his own, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Therefore let your own actions be your index to your attainment on this path of the third ray. For they do speak, and speak they shall, more than to thyself. You see, the true love that inspired the universes can be drawn only from God's heart, the center of all being, the great source of life, power, truth, wisdom, and love and every benign quality that springs therefrom. I would say, then, that inasmuch as there is no other source for love but God, and so many have for so long been absent from the Lord, verily they have lost even the spiritual mechanism within themselves to understand that which they no longer possess. Now, if any find that he is unable to summon love for his brethren, or compassion for the world and its problems, let him consider that this problem indexes a state of spiritual dryness. To be sure, this is a serious shortcoming in the aspirant on the path which may stem from mental rigidity and hardness of heart, products of fear and self-hatred. But perfect love casts out all fear and all torment that fear begets and thy soul hath need to be infused with eternal love by a mighty invocation, fervent in the Holy Spirit. He that fears evidences that he is not yet made perfect in love. He belies the fundamental principle of his relationship with God and, concomitantly, with his beloved twin flame. Without faith in this relationship there can be no other lasting love, for, as Paul says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Without faith in love it is impossible for us to be pleased with ourselves or with any of our relationships, all of which come under the canopy of the first fruits of our love trust with our Father Mother God and our divine counterpart. As Christ spake to his disciples, Cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find, so let all who would manifest more love recognize their need for greater attunement with almighty love through the record in heaven of the Father, the Word, and His Holy Spirit. 16. For even those who do not feel the mighty heartbeat of universal love, and who have been unsuccessful in amplifying its release on behalf of all life upon earth, can through the heavenly trilogy correct their deficiency which, I might add, is not to be taken lightly, unless you, alchemist of the sacred fire, would be adept of the mysteries, continually enkindle love, love as compassion and kindness, love as tolerance and tactfulness, love as approbation and support, patience, long-suffering and forbearance, love as gratefulness and merciful forgiveness, and actively expand it as a flame flower, a many splendored rose whose tender petals unfold all of these qualities and so many more. The law of balance as God's justice will cause the wisdom and power aspects of the threefold flame to be reduced to the lowest common denominator of your externalized love plume. I cannot honestly say that I marvel at the number of spiritual seekers who desire power over themselves, for mastery, and over other parts of life, for control, while ignoring the great law that requires man to express a true and lasting love toward God and self and brother before he can possess both the wisdom and the power of that very love which gave birth to the creation. Remember that just as God cannot be invoked in part, the unfed flame, the fullness of the tripartite flame of power, wisdom and love, must be invoked in its totality and completeness from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit revealed by Jesus Christ. For it is their focus of the divine whole, the creative spark of God's desiring within you, 
and no partial manifestation can generate the cutting action of the whole that arrests light's antithesis, the darkness that would clutch thee to itself, torment, enslave, and possess thy soul. Only thy faithfulness to the Father and Son, thy hopefulness and charity in the spirit of the perpetual Helper, will set free thy captive heart and release both light and spirit of the seeker from the dungeons of self-division and the divisive ones. Thus, day unto day does the glory and power of God's kingdom expand from within the threefold flame of the heart, rarest of all immortals. D. Divine Love Defined we must acknowledge that there are many types of feelings which are called love, but which, in reality, are not. In releasing our trilogy here, we slant our words not wholly to the advanced initiate nor wholly to the beginner, but to a median state where both shall derive the benefit. Therefore, again, let us define love. As the worlds were framed by love, love is both sagacious and potent. For each part of the unfed flame is complementary to every other part and to the whole. Yet love in essence is the very inmost being of God. For love in manifest action is God in manifestation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This love of God to us is fully expressed in the gift of the Father's presence with us, in his gift of the Son whom we know and love in Jesus Christ, in the Emmanuel of our Christ Self, and in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone who loves is born of the Spirit and finds love's fulfillment in this Trinity and in its expression in every part of life. Thus, it can be said and truly that he who loves not has not yet come unto life, for he knows neither self nor neighbor in the image and likeness of love. This God who is love, then, sent forth to us the divine spark, the threefold flame whose threefold attributes of power, wisdom and love are all love's kindling light, the engrafting and engrafted word that alone can raise us to the source who is this love beyond all love expressed. Truly, beloved, love is the Lord's holiness with us, and in his name we say, Holiness unto the Lord. Love is penetrating and expansive. Love is enfolding and transmutative. Love is forgiveness and understanding. Love is wisdom and strength. Love is virtue and purity. Love is dedication and constancy. Love is all of the qualities of God combined with an added ingredient not yet fully known to unascended man and woman, which, for many reasons, we here can neither define nor unveil, except to say that the fullness of love is the very secret of life. Love's secret obedience, power and wisdom garner love's intent, the fullness of God guidance in the twig that bent inclines its ear to hear love's call that shapes the tree of life so straight and tall. As spires rise to clouded heights, the power of love's obedient light, the diadem of life does shine its grail-like motif making all divine. Tis love's excelling mortal plans, enforcing by obedience love's demands, that breaks the deathly sod, and, gazing upward, sees the face of God. John experienced the truth he wrote, that, He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Truly, beloved, this is the perfect equation of God in man and man in God, the consummation of your oneness in the universal Christ. But John also commented on your perfecting of this love. Only the challenge of Antichrist before his very soul could have quickened these words. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. This judgment is the dividing of the way between the real and the unreal within you, your restoration to love's original premise. 
but it is also the climactic cleaving asunder of light and darkness on apocalyptic scale by love's two-edged sword. Indeed, Armageddon is the day of your divine choosing to be your real self in the midst of the world wars of the God. Your boldness to proceed with this walk in love's aloneness, when all around you fools scatter and shatter love's creation, must be based on eons of faith established through trust in almighty love. To challenge the adversary within and without fearlessly in the defense of the unity of love, this is indeed the initiation that must precede, as requirement, the alchemical marriage. To pass it you need the intercession of Chamuel and Charity, the Lord's angels of love, and he shall send them to your side in answer to your call. Divine love, then, is the courage to defend love against all enemies and to know that only love, and love all one, will sustain thee. Having so said and so done, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. E self-love, family love, and human relationship. Now let us peer within the domain of the self of each individual, e'en of thine own self, and perceive the meaning of self-love. And row by row we shall without fear separate the tares from the wheat, and the tears as well. And step by step in love's own mastery you shall mount the spiral stairs of love's degrees. Selfish love is not self-love. That which seeks not that it may share with every other part of God's life, but that it may possess this life unto itself, holding people, things and ideas imprisoned in the domain of exclusivity, is but selfish love. This is the idolatrous adornment of the ego, that which seeketh not its own but another's good, drawing forth abundance that it may expand the glories of life and share them with the many, is a manifestation of truest love. This is true self-love, the love of the true self in all. Self-love, or the love of the real self, does not generate disrespect or aloofness. On the contrary, it regenerates man's faith in the inherent good of all and teaches him, even while admitting the possibility of human error, that error is no part of the real self. When human mistakes, which are but temporary recordings on the chart of man's experience, are cleared by noble deeds and the violet flame, and all inequities are righted by service to divine justice, the fruit of unselfish action will manifest on an altar swept clean of all inordinate desire. For the threshing floor of the heart made pure will provide a suitable altar upon which the unfed flame will more than flicker. Its rising pulsations will expand in the rhythm of life to elevate all whom it contacts, commencing with the aspirant himself. True self-love is the foundation of all other relationship. Now, there are many forms of human love, and these relate principally to man's contact with other parts of life. There is the love of father and mother for one another and their children, and the love of the offspring for its parents. The love of siblings, relatives, neighbors, the servant and his lord, the disciple and master. There is the love of angels for the lowly and of God for his highest creation. There is the love of the Guru and the One Sent for every chela of goodwill. And there are chelas loving one another and the Guru positioned in every sector of cosmos singing praises unto the God-free beings who rule the spheres. And everywhere is love unfolding the mysteries of life, patterning and filling in the pattern of the whole of love. The great law has seen fit to charge the parents of this world with the responsibility for bringing into manifestation the children of the Most High who represent the third point of the life triad. It follows, then, that maternal and paternal influences are destined, and were so intended, to be divinely sponsored matrices. The father person, representing the positive, masculine polarity of the Godhead, has a wonderful and kingly responsibility for each offspring, 
whereas the mother, who nurtures and guards the young child from the period of conception through gestation and birth, has a very close responsibility in bearing wisdom's lotus flame throughout the life of the incoming child. While we are on this subject, it is my earnest wish to clear up for all time certain misconceptions concerning childbearing in the world of form and the use of the vital and generative force by our sons and daughters on the path. First let me say that unless there be some light-bearers who are aware of the frightful opposition to high souls seeking birth on this planet, who are willing in each era to offer themselves as vehicles for the incoming holy and advanced life-streams, it would prove most difficult for us to assist in giving them the proper training from an early age which the great law requires in order for them to fulfill their mission to this darkened world although it is now somewhat lightening and enlightening by devotees' decrees to the violet flame and thus soon to be recognized as freedom's star. In the name of heaven, beloved ones, the guarding of the body, mind, soul, and energy levels of an incoming holy child is an awesome responsibility. It is for this very reason that many desire to sponsor such holy children at inner levels and to act as their spiritual guardians, some being themselves beyond the age of childbearing. While they may elect to stand, as it were, as godfather or godmother for incoming life streams, a good and necessary service, let me point out that to the present hour the natural process of childbirth continues on earth and consequently there is a desperate need for dedicated fathers and mothers. It is true that there are a number of studies being given attention at higher levels to alter the present system of giving birth, to cause the entire process to be painless and more immaculate, raising Earth's evolutions into a new Christ era. Yet we must be most practical and admit to the power of God's love to flow forth through his embodied sons and daughters both to generate and to regenerate all life upon earth. Now you cannot deny, for all around you the evidence stands, that side by side with the light bearers the planet is filled with children who are obviously rebellious spirits. Many of these have been released by the lords of karma to re-embody in recent years, some of them having been detained for a considerable period in the compound, some since the sinking of Atlantis, others having been held in special spheres of assistance in healing temples, awaiting rebirth. The opportunities and restrictions governing the life of each incoming child are determined by their own karma and reviewed by the karmic board to determine what dispensations of mercy may be granted. Each soul receives the approval and seal of the Lord Maha Chohan and beloved mother Mary Pryor to entering the etheric birth canal. Remember, it is simply not possible for us to set aside cosmic law because someone knocking at the portals of birth deems himself wiser than he is. Therefore the law will always act according to God's justice both toward souls awaiting their turn for another opportunity to make things right on earth and toward those who pray for the opportunity to have them, as well as toward those who, mutually bound by difficult karma, have no choice but to play their parts and play them well. The sacred use of God's vital energy for procreative purposes by those who wish to sponsor a family dedicated to constructive purposes is not only admirable but commendable. I do not say that all will or necessarily should elect to pursue this path. Certainly free will must govern all matters of marriage and procreation, for much is at stake and the commitment is large. By a like token, do not think it vanity that desires to house and to nurture a grand life stream, whether that life stream be a karma-free being or one of considerable attainment on the path or a great benefactor of life, but let both parents acknowledge the pure desire to be simply and humbly the Lord's instruments. Remember, dear ones, 
that at the time when an advanced soul comes into embodiment, there is always a scene of parting at higher levels and the full awareness that the mission of that one may or may not be successful. When entering a veil of flesh, there is never any guarantee that that individual will not, through some form of contention, become involved in a karmic situation necessitating a round of unpleasant experiences. Simply because an individual is highly evolved or a Christ one, as was beloved Jesus, does not ensure against failure. There is always a risk, the eventuality that one's friends who had intended to be his guardians and the guardians of his light will betray that light. Then, too, there is the possibility that associates will misinterpret his motives, discount his good intents or ignorantly strive to force him from the ranks of God's service through impugning his character, and in other regrettable manners fail to assist his holy purposes through misunderstanding and indifference aggravated by the opposition of the sinister force. Let all recognize that upon the earth body in this present hour there are children of light and children of mammon. Although Jesus said, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Let all realize that the children of light must become wiser than the children of mammon. I do not deny that some of the children of mammon have behaved as children of light and that some children of light have behaved as children of mammon. This does not prove that the law is wrong. It simply proves the tenacity of the element of human discord, vanity, and sin on the one hand and on the other the power of the Creator's inherent goodness that seeks to raise all life. It also proves that laggard qualities are contagious and that vigilance is required to hold an immaculate concept regardless of what appearances may be involved and to guard the heirs of the promises from the astral contagions of modern life and bad examples parading everywhere. Certainly virtuous motherhood, such as Mother Mary offered, is yet the requirement of the hour. Inasmuch as I am dealing here with interrelationships between people, I want to point out that in the case of employer and employee, there ought never to exist any form of slavery or tyranny. It is as much the responsibility of the employee as the employer to see that this slavery does not exist. Therefore, let brotherly love continue. The word of the Lord recorded in the second chapter of Genesis brings to mind love's enduring tribute to the creation of twin flames in the white fire o void and their divine love which endures unto the blessing of all other human relationships. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Where the karma of twin flames does not allow their togetherness in a given life, Soul mates as partners on the path brought together for a special service also provide the polarity for the cosmic wholeness to be nurtured on earth in the complementary roles of Alpha and Omega. This statement from Genesis concerning man's aloneness has also been correctly interpreted as meaning, it is not good for the manifestation to be all one. Therefore, I will make individual parties of my aloneness, or, as the Lord promised Abraham, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the sea shore. And so, let the love of the individual parts for one another and for the whole exceed self-love, and excel unto an expansion of love within the creation in honor of the Creator, finding thereby reunion with the one life which is all and in all. F. Christ love, the great and awesome power of creativity that floods forth myriad and wondrous forms in nature and in man, that creates cosmic beings and angel messengers of fire, holds in cosmic mind the truth that a love not wholly integrated with the allness of the cosmos and the oneness thereof would not be God, would not be good. Inasmuch as goodness requires some objective manifestation of itself in order to love, 
the great creative will of God was and is to create many self-expressions in form. The wondrous design of twin flames descending from the sun to unveil in flesh the faces of Alpha and Omega in so many ways, sons and daughters of the Most High, children of the One basking in the love play of angels and elementals, guarded by nature's spirits, luminous presences and mighty beings of the Elohimic spheres, all in one grand hierarchical order, that each one, from an electron to a star, might, in receiving his love, return that love not only to the central sun and the Creator, but also to all creatures he has made, dwelling now in the peripheral worlds of time and space. Few have reached the level of St. Francis of Assisi in their comprehension of this concept concerning the multifaceted parts of the one individed whole. I would, therefore, call to your attention the great depth of compassion and the true scientific understanding of the psychology of the soul, far in advance of his time, which your blessed Kuthumi externalized in his embodiment as dear Francis, and which remain to the present hour in his ascended state the outstanding qualities of his service with beloved Jesus in the office of world teacher. Truly his life was a message of God's love born in the chalice of the fiery heart of the saint for all life's expressions. Dear Francis' love for creatures great and small compassed the sea, the sky, and all. His love the outbreathed universe did frame, as stars and soul compassions flame on path, where every open heart did sing and hopes did rise like bird on wing. O love, thy flame shall bear one yet on high. O love that lives and cannot die, to cross the bar and then become a part of God's own fiery beating heart. For where I am in shining knowing free, I feel the power of truth fill me. What thrills me most as cup runs over now is this great truth, that I am thou. How great was his example! Yet, the great example need not be anyone with whom you are familiar, or it may be anyone with whom you are familiar. In the history of Christendom the great example finds its purest form and expression in the figure and divinely human personality of Jesus. And yet I do not blaspheme when I say that many men and women in embodiment today have, through their devotion to Jesus and to the great God Self, received the same sacred love tokens from God's heart that the Almighty imparted unto Jesus. The dove of the Holy Spirit has rested upon their heads, and its snow-white radiance of purity has flowed from their hearts. Though not always well known, the divine gifts of healing, of miracles and of teaching and preaching the Word of God have been given unto them also. Some have founded no new religion, all have supported holy endeavors and sought to be examples of God's purity. Over the centuries mature sons and daughters of God of considerable accomplishment in many fields, prophets, teachers, reformers and not a few great lights, have brightened the planetary corner with their presence and by their balanced expression and generous sharing of their developed threefold flame, to which the Savior by His grace has added His momentum, they have been way showers of the path of individual Christhood ordained by God not for one Son alone but for all heirs of His light. For unto all who believe in the reality of the Christ flame in Jesus, the Master has the power to make them, by love's enkindling power, by the engrafting of the word, to make them, I say, more the Son of God. Thus it is written, John 1 verse 12, and thus the ascended Master Jesus Christ initiates his disciples today by the heart-to-heart -heart impartation of his flame unto those who work his works and embody his word. I would, therefore, offer this plaudit on their behalf 
this acknowledgement in freedom's name that the world is not so poor as it sometimes considers itself to be in the manifestation of this great God essence of love, but that it already possesses a great wealth of divine love, a love all too often unrecognized even when seen, a love that commemorates Jesus' devotion to his fold and upholds the standard he set for those who would follow him indeed. To them he also paid tribute with the words, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. This love, as life's essential ingredient, flows not only from God on high to the hearts of known and unknown manifestations of himself below, but also from holy men and women in embodiment, whose love as devotion and service to every part of God's life becomes day by day more like unto the Father and the Son in their mutual adoration. Man's penetration of the holy substance of God's essential love provides him, through the power of the Maha Chohan, with an infusion of that Elon which makes the world go round. That it does not spin faster, that it does not more swiftly throw off its discord, can be attributed to the impediments to divine love sustained by the masses who yet know not what they do. Those hearts, and many of them yearn to know the truth and to be free, who pursue a dyed-in-the-wool path of their own misguided wills and spew out hatred against men of good will whom they do not understand, do indeed place their feet in ruts of stumbling upon the mountain of attainment. And although the great connecting link, the lifeline from on high, as a giant skein of light and life dropped down to earth, continually pulls man forward, the traction created by the pulling back of these people, the recalcitrance of a stiff-necked generation, compounded by the sheer weight of their numbers exercising free will in opposition to, as the antithesis of, the divine, does in effect prevent the universal manifestation of God's kingdom upon earth. G. Harmony, the fulfilling of the law of love. In the holy name of love we would speak in a practical manner on the great need for keeping and maintaining one's personal harmony, not only in one's feelings but also in one's thoughts. For harmony is not only the law of love, it is the epitome of love, the sign of love's true conquering heroes. Now, as many of you know, when the thought desires to go to the right and the feelings pull to the left, most often it is the feelings that win out and the thought, by rationalization, will gravitate in their direction. And in many cases, unless, of course, the feelings are motivated by purest love, this is not the fulfillment of the law of harmony. Rather it is very often a compromise made by the soul caught between the mental and feeling worlds. And it can result in that peace without honor which, because it is not based on principle, cannot provide the permanent solution to the problem. In all his noble efforts to precipitate substance alchemically, man will find no higher alchemical key than the purity of divine love flowing forth from his consciousness as God's thoughts and feelings, winged messengers of light delivering blessings, attracting more of their kind and returning to the alchemist the blessings of the abundant life. The love of God made manifest in the threefold flame scintillates with immortal brilliance. Its vibrant, radiant, all-enfolding light comprises the sun-flame centers of all interrelated macrocosmic-microcosmic energy systems in material and spiritual manifestation. Withdraw the power of love from any of these and their eventual collapse is certain. Every system of worlds, planetary or starry body that has ever been dissolved, whatever the apparent or scientific reason, has collapsed from within due to the withdrawal of the love charge from the sun center. 
the lapse from the moment of withdrawal to the moment of dissolution may range from thousands to even millions of years as men reckon time. Or it may consist of a few microseconds or the pause between them. But the decay of every system begins with the withdrawal of love's lodestone from its center. Love, then, is truly the cohesive power of the universe. One of the most dreaded diseases upon earth today manifests as a result of mankind's hatred toward one another, which, when it returns to the sender, drives the love element from the cells, thereby causing a perversion of their function. Through invasion and metastasis, the disease eventually spreads throughout the body, and death ensues when the form, whose cells have lost the cohesive power of love, can no longer magnetize enough light to sustain the bodily functions. Though the cause may be ancient, having lain dormant for lifetimes, the karma comes due. Only flood tides of love and oceans of violet fire can bring permanent resolution to the festering hatred that lodges in the psyche of man. Yet to this day some have vowed to bear world karma in their members. Saints without blemish are these who take into their bodies the world's sin of human hatred. Thus judge not the infirm, but help them, uphold them, heal them, by love. In healing the many types of cancer and other physical, mental, or emotional disorders, the invocation to divine love is essential and the healer must be all love in action. Jesus' compassionate response to the cry of the two blind men, Thou Son of David, have mercy on us, was a personal action of divine love. He touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, be it unto you. The Master's healing of the woman who touched his garment without his knowledge was an example of the impersonal action of divine love. His response, Who touched me? For I perceive that light hath passed from me to her, showed that the impersonal Christ had healed her through him without his foreknowledge. Divine love as the living Christ, the Son behind every Son of Man, is both personal and impersonal, and it is fulfilled measure for measure, as ye are able, in every one of you through the cycles of the law of your being, the law that is ever love in manifestation. When you exercise it, the law of love unites the purity of justice, mercy, and freedom in perfect balance through the threefold flame within your heart. Let those who will, Discount the law as love and deny its corrective measures as an action of love. I charge you to remember the words, Whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. In closing this trilogy, then, I say unto all, Let not selfish love carry you into the byways of delusion, far and apart from your brothers and sisters and those other parts of life, whom God has made. Remember, too, that those who have chosen to embody elements of evil ever seek to divide the children of the light by subtlety, flattery, hypocrisy, money schemes, sexual entanglements, etc. You yourself can name the rest. Whereas true love would unify the sons and daughters of God in the very essence of holiness and world service. To pay tribute to love is to pay tribute to the great drawing power of God's own tripartite flame. Love is God's flame of being in manifestation. One day the scientists of the world, through special instruments, will be able to measure a portion of the love flame and its radiant energies, but never will an instrument be made that has a scale great enough to measure the all-encompassing power of infinite love. Infinite love can best be expressed as the manifestation of God. The manifestation of God can occur in everyone. It is the destiny of man that shakes from man his dust. Love, then, is the fullness of God as he manifests man. I tell you there is no limit to the degree of God's love which anyone who will may manifest.
anyone who wills to invoke it, to be it, and to share it may be the answer to love's call and calling. Here in the realm of divine love is the city of God, the foursquare city described by beloved John, as the place of conscious attainment where the fullness of your aspirations may find unhampered expression. Here your soul looks out upon the great wide open spaces of the creation. Love has unlimited new worlds to conquer. Love is the promised land where the strength of the lion's nature is given to the heart of the lamb, and the good shepherd of the eternal covenant seals all in the victory of the expanding three-in-one flame of Godgood, worlds without end. For thine is the kingdom, the consciousness of God, his wisdom. Thine is the power, the unlimited, inexhaustible strength to be and to fulfill your fiery destiny. And thine is the glory, the crowning light of love's diadem of perfection, forever and forever. Amen. Thy God hath willed it so. I am faithfully in freedom's cause and service.